When I first envisaged a follow-up to my QBasic video, I thought I'd be showing you those same programs I wrote once again, but in rather more detail with extra aggrieved commentary about how rubbish I was at programming when I was 14. As I looked at them, I started to think, why not fix them? Why not make them the programs 14-year-old me wanted them to be, as a sort of favour through the timeline to myself? A kind of self-obsessed IBM PC and compatibles version of the thing what host snorkers does for ZX Spectrum type-ins. And if the idea of someone opening up and improving ancient basic programs sounds like your sort of thing, I thoroughly recommend you go to his channel and see it's done by someone who can actually be bothered to buy a green screen for their live action skits. Anyway, here's Oval Racer. I want to start with this, partly because it's one of the earliest of my QBasic games, but also because it shows what a wonderful language the Microsoft Basics were for a beginner programmer. Just 427 lines to produce what is recognisably a game, even if not a good one. If I look closer, it's not even 427 lines because the first 40 are comments, and the last 108 are all of the hand-coded multicolour print statements for every frame of an animation used to tell you that you've crashed when the somewhat arbitrary collision detection kicks in. So what have we got? First, we have me failing to understand how the sub-keyword works, and declaring subroutines which I never define. Well, that's another five lines I can take off the count of code needed to produce a simple racing game. There's also some solid failing on my part to understand the dim statement. I think, at this point I assumed you had to map out where each array sat in memory manually. Hence the weird non-overlapping subscripts. We could just fix that, and also fix this array being somewhat larger than needed. Other than the code quality, I reckon this intro is one of the nicer ones found in my QBasic programs. Yes, it doesn't use an image loader or anything fancy like that, but sometimes simpler is better. Maybe this just has more retro beginner programmer charm for me all these years later. Of course, this is a rather slow and laborious way of producing the background and little text box from someone who wasn't aware of the box line for QBasic lines. That, again, is fixable. Arguably, we could replace all of this with a data statement or loading the little sprite from disk, but, you know, let's keep this to something my 14-year-old self might recognise. A philosophy which, I should point out, lasts barely more than a third of the way into this video. But right now I'm sticking to it. The intro itself is a simple loop which can be skipped by pressing escape. I'll clean that up a little and also make it a little less of a tedious wait on slow CPUs, while I'm still doing low-stake stuff past me might have recognised. These little sweeps using the play command are cool, and much more tolerable than most of the theme songs I ever wrote. But I feel with 50 notes to play, the first one could run as part of the loop which draws the TW games boxes, helping put an upper limit on the speed it runs. QBasic's play command runs asynchronously, most likely using an interrupt behind the scenes, but if you issue a second one, it waits for the first to complete before adding it to the queue. I've also merged the oval racer text with the first screen in slightly clunky fashion, then I wait for a key before starting the game, rather than just dumping you straight in as the original version did. Moving further down, there's some code which draws the car sprites so it can capture them, in classic Donkey.Bass style fashion, yes, even Microsoft did this. With that sprite drawing completed, we have a simple game of driving a boxy car around a track. With... eh... Uh, some problems. The first is the persistent flicker. Second is the game's tendency to crash trying to play an illegal sound. In this case, something mildly illegal, like a frequency the sound command doesn't support, rather than something seriously illegal due to extreme tastelessness, like playing the Cilla Black version of You've Lost That Loving Feeling in preference to the Righteous Brothers one. Which, as we know from previous videos of mine, you could do over a PC speaker. But don't. 
Even if you overcome both of those bugs, and stick to the Andrew Luke Oldham approved version of the song as all right thinking people should, you find no real handling to speak of. Collision detection, which is hopelessly touchy in some directions and ridiculously lenient in others. And of course, everyone's favourite way of cheating in a racing game, driving back and forth across the start line to increase the lap counter. No checkpoints here. In my mildly updated version of the programme, lines 86 to 155 are responsible for drawing the car sprite and capturing it into those weirdly dimensioned arrays. Lines 157 to 185 draw the track. And then we're into the game loop. Said game loop is where the limits of my youthful programming inexperience are clear to see, as each direction is implemented as a separate mini game loop. These also call themselves using GoSub, so play Oval Racer for long enough, and you will eventually run out of stack space. There is, amongst all this, one nice touch of grabbing the area of screen memory where the car sprite will be placed, then replacing it. A very primitive kind of dirty rectangle graphics update. It's flickery because I don't pay attention to the vertical refresh and quite often do it in the middle of the screen being drawn, but it's so almost correct. Well done, younger me. Now, as I said, my original intention here was to make this slightly better, by which I mean broadly the same thing, but at least functional. So anyway, I wrote my own polygon renderer. This is not a sensible thing for someone who should be putting videos out on some kind of predictable schedule and therefore limiting the amount of work each one requires to do. But I talked about this as a sort of favour through the timeline, and I'm pretty sure that if 14-year-old me had seen this on the screen in front of him, knowing it was done in QBasic, he'd have thought it was cool AF. Well, he wouldn't, because using AF as an intensifier only started to achieve global popularity around 2014, but I'm sure he'd have used some 90s equivalent like tubular or rude. I've used a couple of QBasic tricks to make this as fast as I can. Using the inbuilt graphics primitives is way faster than trying to p-set or poke things pixel by pixel, because QBasic's p-code interpreter will be slowed down so much by processing the code, even for just a for a while loop, that it's slower unless I start messing around with assembler and machine code to implement my pixel copy routine. Which is perhaps a topic for another time. But because I draw each horizontal line of the polygon with the line command, it doesn't matter whether each working edge refers to the left or right hand edge respectively. And if I restrict myself to drawing just triangles, all I need to do is make sure the vertices are in height order and split the triangle in two sections at its middle vertex and it will all work. In fact, most of the time is spent not plotting pixels, but building those edge lists, which uses a Bresnum style algorithm which I totally didn't half inch from that big Michael A. Brush book of mine and translate. Mine is split up into separate routines for the starting and ending line lists, and it removes one of the optimization cases because the gain from the optimization was smaller than the slowdown from QBasic having to interpret an extra if statement. See? Totally different. Hang on a second. Let's back right up, and not just to cheat by going across the starting line again. I'm throwing out terms like Bresnum style algorithm, when I could be usefully explaining something which is core to how a huge number of early polygon based games worked, even if they weren't programmed in QBasic. If you look up polygon rendering in a graphics textbook, it will probably tell you, in dry and somewhat inscrutable detail, about the scanline approach. This is where you go across the screen one line at a time, and each time you intersect the edge of a polygon, you either start or stop filling. This handles all sorts of polygons, providing they don't self-intersect, but is also rather slow, as we need to check an entire line of pixels at a time. But if we only draw convex polygons, these have a nice property that any line intersects the polygon only twice, this being the definition of convex. As a result, it can be represented with a single pair of x-coordinates for each line of the screen, 
one for the start and one for the end, of all pixels inside the polygon. But how do we calculate these? Well, I'm sure my maths teachers at the time I wrote Oval Racer would have been busy trying to fill my head with y equals mx plus c and all of that. And we can indeed do that. Work out which edges of the polygon will be intersecting for each line, which is easy for a triangle, just sort the vertices in order of their y-coordinate, and you know you have two edges for the top half and two edges for the bottom. And then, by working out the gradient, we know, for example, that for each pixel step downward on this edge, we need to take 2.4 pixel steps across. Which, for anyone who knows about old PCs and that, highlights two problems. Firstly, we can't step by 0.4 pixels. Secondly, even if we round up or down to even numbers of pixels, we'll be using floating point calculations, which even on CPUs with a floating point unit are catastrophically slower than integer maths on anything produced in the 1990s. But a repeated step of 2.4 pixels, rounded to the nearest pixel, could be considered as a series of steps of either 2 pixels or 3 pixels. If we knew how many steps of 2 pixels we needed to take before making a step of 3 pixels, we could do all of this using integers alone, which is possible by introducing an error term, a number which increases with each step taken, then when it exceeds a certain value, we take the larger of the two steps and reduce the error by an appropriate amount, repeating a loop, and this gives the same result as adding 2.4 at a time and rounding the result, but a lot faster on vintage hardware. The values for this error term vary according to whether the line increases in the x direction more than it does y, and in the case that it's vertical, we don't need to mess around with error terms at all, as we know every x coordinate will be the same. Doing this for both starting and ending edges for every line in the polygon, between its smallest and largest y coordinates, gives a list of lines which, when drawn, will display it on screen. Repeat across enough polygons, and now it makes a simple car. Or, if you're working in something a bit faster than QBasic, an entire 3D world. I am not working in something a bit faster than QBasic, so simple car it is. You may wonder why I've gone to all of this trouble when I could have just made a simple car sprite in a paint program and loaded it in. Well, let's look at it from a different angle. Yes, in a move that would have seemed rude, tubular, and perhaps even radical AF to my past self, I now have a smoothly rotating car. Well, for certain values of smooth, because this is done authentically DOS style, using fixed point integer maths, resulting in the occasional wobbling polygon. This is only so much fun as a tech demo, and by so much, I mean not much at all, so it's time I ripped out Oval Racer's old game logic and card drawing code, and put the new fancy version in its place. A little bit of tweaking, and now we have a nice, flicker-free car wandering around that track. Of course, replacing all the game logic means I've lost the actual game portion of this. Well, what little game there was. The intention of Oval Racer is to race around the track without going off it too far into the runoff or infield. My youthful development efforts ran into two classic failings here. The first is not using any checkpoints. What I need to do is not just check whether the car has crossed the finish line, facing in the correct direction, but check that it's crossed several different points around the track first. I'm going to add some simple logic to the game loop to define four checkpoints, one on each straight, and the start-finish line itself. This now works nicely, but with my checkpoints being rather lenient, we can still cut corners quite easily. I could solve this by visualising the checkpoint areas and tightening up those hitboxes, but I should also restore the collision logic from the original game to add some much-needed challenge and difficulty. 
And now that I have some crash logic, I'm not a fan of that old text-based crash screen. So let's replace it with the classic QBasic end of game effect, a line explosion, and some PC speaker sound effects. Which will, admittedly, serve mainly as an encouragement not to crash again. This effect is easy to set up, as I already have the sign and cos tables from doing the car rotation, and as an added bit of historical accuracy, I have kept some of my original multicolour crash message. But we also need a positive end to the game. Let's end after the player has completed 10 laps, and show them both their total time and best lap time. For this, I'll use the internal timer to keep track of the total time, and by tracking the time each lap starts, I can also calculate the current and therefore best lap time. And with that, there's only one thing left. A nice windscreen to show the player what their final time was. I'm going to do this simply by redrawing the track and then drawing a bunch of cars at different angles of rotation, then printing the final statistics. And, of course, to cap it all off, an obnoxious tune. This is now a simple, functional game. It also, thanks to the joys of interpreted code, requires a Pentium 120 to run at a consistently smooth 35 frames per second, and even running it in the much faster Quick Basic 4.5 only drops those requirements to a clock doubled 486. But would I still have been immensely proud to have programmed this as a kit, even if it needed the fastest computer in the school computer room to run it properly? Absolutely! I mean, I'm sort of proud now. And, as you will have seen if you watched the video where I showed an overview of all my QBasic efforts, in the programming club, slideshow graphics were not the problem I might think they are now. And with a bit of adjusting your expectations back 25 or so years, it's playable even on a relatively slow 486. Just about. The important thing for me is that this is still vanilla QBasic, with no clever tricks involving machine code. This would have been possible to have written at school using only the officially sanctioned tools. We definitely had the occasional Pentium 133 lurking around to run it in its full glory. And had there not been the whole Windows 95, no programming for you situation after a couple of years, then it's possible I might have written something like this after Flying Eye. Making one very bold assumption that teenage me would have had the patience to transcribe a polygon edge scanning routine out of the big Michael Abrash book into QBasic. Indeed, with only a small amount of code golf on my part, this is only 112 lines longer than the original Oval Racer. Admittedly, I did delete a lot of comments about the version history, but this still shows why QBasic was such a great beginner language. You really don't need much to produce something fun. 539 lines of commented code makes a simple car game. Which, to go back to that aim of producing what 14-year-old me originally wanted to make, this is now a fun game. It might be simple, but that didn't stop me losing about an hour while trying to write the script for this video, getting distracted by Oval Racer, and playing until I could complete a whole 10 lap session. Admittedly, some of the challenge comes from my slightly janky input handling, especially combined with my insistence on putting in sub 7 second laps. But even when a crash happens, it feels fair. The controls only ever freak out and fail to register keys, when I was already relying on a last minute key press to get me out of a situation I shouldn't have gotten into. Speaking of situations nobody should be getting into, I hope you enjoyed that diversion into Antique Cube Basic Rescue as much as I did. It's like one of those repair shop programs, except I'm only fixing it because I feel like it and not because this program is a family heirloom which needs to be presented as the gift at a wedding in just two weeks from now. You know, because that's totally the kind of family they'd put at the centre of an emotional TV story. For your wedding present, 
I got you this old QBasic program. Yay! Anyway, if you'd like to see more of me going through my own programs and fixing them, in addition to going through other people's programs and trying to figure out how they work, then let me know via the usual medium of the comments section, or, you know, the retention of viewer numbers, because if I stare at that long enough, I can eventually take a hint. I might even find somewhere to stick the revised version of Oval Racer. So, if you have a QBasic installation, you can see all the horrible coding compromises which get made when it just has to look okay on screen for a few minutes, like a DOS themed version of Pimp My Ride. Because, you know, that would be Vintage Programming Club to have other people play a QBasic game I've written and be annoyingly better at it than me. Like the third series of the Sweeney when they uh, couldn't afford to do freeze frame. So they used to just have to stand on the car door and pretend that it was a freeze frame. Really didn't work. <laughs>